Hi, I'm Lainey Law. And I'm attorney Andrew Myers. Today we're coming at you with another special episode about the law. We're going to be talking about TikTok, social media, the effects it has on people, and whether or not it should be banned. So for a lot of people, I guess in my age group, we grew up with, at least for me, going into middle school, high school, you know, Facebook and social media started to pick up. And it's interesting from my perspective, because even though it wasn't as prominent, I still remember the impact it had on kids. I remember seeing like Facebook hate groups were like a thing uh, way back when for hate like groups? students. What's a hate group? I a hate group? You don't know? You've never seen a hate group? They, oh my god! Couldn't somebody stop that? I mean, why, why I, would you have a hate group and wouldn't they somehow stop it? No. Uh, so. <laughs> I think now, I think cyberbullying has become more of like a focus, but before, so with the hate groups on Facebook, people used to make like pages and you used to be able to make a page anonymously, so people didn't know who made it, but they'd make like, oh, I hate Samantha you know, whatever, it's like a student or something, or sometimes a celebrity. Um, and then it's just like people would go in and start dogpiling on that person. And that even now, it's actually still a thing where I I think they are starting to do something more about it recently. Um, I've never seen it, but I know there was like websites I called like Kiwi Farms, um, 4chan, Lol cow. I mean, 4chan is like a conglomeration of stuff, but uh, you could have like these groups of people getting together and like really dogpiling on whether it be like an internet celebrity or just like a random person. Um, they are like. No, it, I have I have heard of hate groups, but I thought that at some point <laughs> along the way, I mean, I know that I don't know six, seven, eight years ago, they, there were actually a couple of suicides because of them, and I thought that after all of that went down, I thought that they had done something about it but you're telling me no they they still can get away with that kind of stuff i i'm assuming i don't use facebook really that much anymore so i'm assuming facebook has solved that because i like you said it's just like you know people it was horribly ruining impacting these people's lives but um i know that even recently like on other like i know that there's still or that there were still websites that I think are having issues now that now they're getting trying people are trying to take them down and now web servers are not hosting them but it was still like up until 2023 uh late 2022 maybe uh you could just go on these websites and you can find like threads upon threads of like <laughs> them don't insulting someone have, over the clothes <laughs> don't people have anything better to do with their time I mean that's crazy Never. let me ask you <laughs> Let me ask you a couple of questions because I don't know. I mean, I've been on Facebook for a long, long time, and I mean a long time. I mean, I have two Facebooks, one for me personally and one for my law office. So I think I have Facebook down. When I first started blogging, as you know, I started blogging about 12 years ago. You know, the advice from all the experts was to also have all the others. Like uh, I would then send my stuff out over on LinkedIn, and I would send my stuff out over Twitter and some of the other things, but um, I have to admit, um, you're going to have to help me here. What's the difference between two? And I know there's a big difference, but what's the difference? I'm going to show how stupid I am. What's the difference between TikTok and Twitter? So Twitter is on fire right now. Um, <laughs> so Twitter is. Although Twitter, you can post images and you can post videos, it's primarily text-based. Up until recently, um, there were character limits. The purpose of Twitter originally was that people would just get a thought out really quick. You're not supposed to type out right. paragraphs. Um, TikTok is the same concept, except in like brain-rotting video form that it's algorithm. In what form? What did you say? <laughs> what brain form? rot? <laughs> what is that? So... <laughs> 
on TikTok. <laughs> There's a lot of content. It's delivered to you really fast, and it's delivered to you in ways that are like gonna specifically like tweak your emotions. Uh, I was talking to a client uh, the other day doing her hair, and I was telling her how if like if it almost feels like you hit don't interest it and you're not interested in something on TikTok, that TikTok shows it like more because it's trying to get a rise out of you TikTok, a lot of the videos you know can be under five seconds even and you're just scrolling scrolling and it's easy to indefinitely scroll because it intentionally gives you something that's like close to what you want to see versus like you know satisfying you so now, with twitter um, it's not as specific okay is there a difference in terms of I think Twitter, if you post something on Twitter, it stays there. Like my blog articles would stay there for a certain amount of time. Whereas I think the idea with TikTok is it, it goes away, correct? That's so TikTok has parts of that. So there's an app called Snapchat, which is like you take pictures, you send them, and they like, unless oh, right. the person saves it, yeah. But right. TikTok also has its own feature, <laughs> has a couple of different features. TikTok has stories, which are posts that you post and it's highlighted, and it's like goes in a special like highlight on your page, and then it's gone after 24 hours. You can still access that. Um, it also has posts that are called nows, which it's like you take a picture of yourself and you take a picture of what you're doing, and that also goes away within 24 hours. Generally, TikTok videos, you can delete them, uh, but a traditional TikTok, like the fifth, five to, you know, now 10 minute videos, um, you can post them on your profile and people, they can be there forever, you can delete them, and people can also like download them and react to them and do things like that. Okay, we saw Snapchat when we did the podcast on uh, oh, Murdoch, Murdoch because, <laughs> because his son had taken a Snapchat and people thought it went away. Mm -hmm. And after the murders and after uh, Alexander Murdoch came up with a alibi, the FBI and the South Carolina law enforcement dug into the son's phone Snapchat. and they found that it didn't go away at all, even though he hadn't posted it. It was still there and they found it in that blew a huge hole into Murdoch's um, al alibi. So let's get back to today and here and now. Let's look back. Do you think that um, in your high school years, do you, and this goes back, I know, um, <laughs> do you think that uh, having all this stuff, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and all this, do you think it was good or do you think it was harmful? I can't imagine what it's like being a parent today because it's everywhere. I think that there's a lot of reasons that kids should not have access to the internet. There's a lot of times where I, as an adult, like I will scroll on, t scroll on TikTok, TikTok showing me random videos. And there are times that as an adult, I need to like close the app. I'm like, oh my God, like I can't believe that was, I saw that like a lot of the times like, not a lot, but, like, I've gotten posts of, like, talking about people, you know, basically, like, oh, my cousin got murdered by this person and there's no justice and it's, like, a whole time. Like, there's a lot of, like, potentially traumatizing things on TikTok and there's also, like, um, not just TikTok, but, like, all social media. And I think, especially in, like, younger groups of kids, when you haven't developed, like, that empathy for other people, I think that there's a lot of meanness when it comes to, like, teenagers right. and young kids on the internet. Um, so I can't imagine being a parent and you don't want to give your kid a phone because you don't want them to get into these drama aspects but then the kids are getting bullied for not having a phone and the kids are not included and these kids are not learning like how to be responsible on the internet there's a lot of kids that might post something that you know they might regret um and it might really negatively impact them but at the same time they're kind of learning you know don't post everything on the internet so you're it's that balance where it's just like I, having a healthy dialogue with your kid would be really important, but I think that most kids on the internet in general are just kind of getting free reign. And I think that's right. like, like I said, TikTok rots your brain. 
I can't imagine it's, growing it's, up with TikTok. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned um, that it's kind of hard to figure, you know, what parents would do because there are parents out there that just say no none of this you're not allowed to have a phone you're not allowed to be on uh, the internet I even uh, had one parent that I interacted with that said no my children don't do any social media they have to go outside and, <laughs> and play and, 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 and they have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts not that those are bad things but mm -hmm. they have you know Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts they go to their clubs they ride their bicycles they go outside and uh I don't let them go on social media. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's what I was told. But it seems like an extreme. The other extreme would just be leave the kids alone and let them TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook all day, all night. I'm just wondering how people arrive at a happy medium uh, and actually, like you said before, have a conversation with their kids. Is that is that a possibility to have a happy uh, medium and, 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 and converse with the children and say, sure, on a nice day, go out and, and play, but on a, you know, limited basis, it's okay to be on uh, social media? Is that even possible? I don't know. It's because I'm not a parent myself, but I do live stream and I do have parents that watch me and I have parents that have watched me with their kids. And it's hard because there are a lot of parents out there who have very good healthy relationships with their children and are able to kind of communicate like the internet and show them certain things and have certain boundaries and that the kids can respect what the parents say and i think that it's nice i think um you know this recent generation of parents i think is doing a lot more parenting with empathy however with like we still have like the ipad babies where it's like a parent will get a have a kid they you know have a lot of stress in their own life and they aren't necessarily sure to handle their kid and they just kind of give the kid the ipad and let the kid play with the ipad for the next 18 years <laughs> so yeah. it's just like it, are there ways yes i think that what's happening which is scaring me is that a lot of kids these ipad babies um are getting their parenting online so i think that there's creators out there that can be a positive influence but it's been an issue with kids nowadays that they like a lot of boys have like this macho wannabe persona and that are being disrespectful more to women and stuff like that because they kind of fall into that wrong spear they see like a cool guy is just like oh yeah like you know i'm going to teach you how to be alpha and now you're seeing in schools like kids are misbehaving in class because of things like TikTok and kind of being geared away from more empathy so i think that if people are consuming empathetic content or people are having conversations with their parents that's good but it also goes the opposite direction like can it yeah. be done yeah but is it being done there, not always there have always been bullies and alpha dog people trying to you know have superiority over other people that's always existed mm -hmm. as, i guess this is a stupid question but um i'll ask it anyhow do you really think it's any worse with uh, social media i do because when it's happening in real life you can see how other people are affected by the actions of others it's just like if someone bullies someone and makes someone cry in real life and you're watching that you can kind of watch that and be like oh that person's being a dick but if it's on the internet it's yeah. like this guy's like yeah yeah, yeah. and he's bull like they're cyberbullying someone and that person's not live in that moment or not putting their life on it's just like you're not seeing that you're actually ruining this person's life do you ever worry when you're online or do you, your friends ever worry when they're online that everything and anything they say and do and either stuff that's in their computer can be um, misused by people on the other end and people in between you know you're in one place right now I'm in another place right now and hackers can maybe get stuff out of your computer and my computer and all the internet wizards that are between the two of us do you worry about that honestly 
I do worry about it, but we don't even need hackers and internet wizards anymore. That people put out so much of their own information where it's just like, and that was like a thing with like social media growing up. It's just like, who's to stop like your friend from like getting into your Facebook and like doing stuff like that. So it used like before it required a lot more internet smarts to get into someone's profile. But now it's like, you can just see if there's like a data leak, find your friend's password and log into all of their accounts. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> like, or your friend, you know, you're not going to do it to your actual friend. But I think that, uh, it's very, if you have malicious intent, I think the internet makes it very easy to execute. Yeah, what do you think about efforts? Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately. Uh, efforts by states, state by state, and even the United States government at the congressional level to get rid of TikTok. Let's, you know, TikTok has ties to China, so let's, let's ban it. What are your thoughts about that? I think that all social media is like brain rotting our youth, and I don't really think that TikTok's doing anything different. <laughs> yeah. I guess the real concern uh, by some is that um, China, uh, oh, well, no, China doesn't own TikTok, but TikTok is owned by a Chinese comp uh, company by the name of uh, ByteDance. Isn't that a nice name? So ByteDance owns TikTok. And people are concerned that in China, the government can pretty much call any business and ask them all kinds of questions. So the concern is really, oh, geez, uh, people that are on TikTok have all of their information in their computer and everything that they say, subject to the um, control of the, or the overview uh, or the snooping of the Chinese government. And that's, that's the concern and even uh, one state has banned TikTok altogether. Montana, oddly enough, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the state of Ted Kaczynski. I thought uh, we love free speech. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in New Hampshire and Georgia, the governments have banned TikTok on government computers, on government computers only, because to go further than that is a problem, especially with respect to the First Amendment. But um, so the Congress has held hearings and Congress called the CEO of TikTok, who's from Singapore, and they called him in. And yeah, I don't know if you caught any of the video, but it was kind of amusing because there was a question as to whether even some of the congressmen understood <laughs> what social media was all about. Now, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe the question was portrayed out of con uh, context. But one of the congressmen even asked, well, does Snapchat go through your Wi-Fi? <laughs> so the people that have the ability to control what we do and what we say may or may not even understand it. So that that was a concern to me. How how seriously would it hurt your life if they did ban TikTok? So. My thing with that is like they say, like like oh TikTok's controlled by the Chinese government is almost completely like ignoring the fact that like a huge 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 portion of like all the internet is Chinese companies like gaming like League of Legends is a huge game um, that millions of people play and I believe apps like Discord are also owned by companies like Tencent so um, when or at least has like a part in it a stake in it so I think that the concern that it's from China is just like I think that if that's the route they're going, if we're cutting off chi ties to China, I think, like, that's wrong for a lot of reasons. Like, we're losing, you know, the things that we're using and enjoying. And also, it's just like, like, you know, it's just like, really? Like, on it. like the thing is, it's just like, how, like, what data are they even getting that's that valuable? Like, government phones, yes, don't put TikTok on them, don't put Facebook on them, don't put Snapchat on them, don't, like, you don't need social media. Like, I feel on a government issued phone, I don't think it's fair to exclude TikTok specifically when we, a lot of people who use Facebook, you just saw, like, there was just like a kickback from like some lawsuit that Facebook had for selling your data is it's not right. that TikTok's doing anything exceptionally wrong and it's just like you know 
I, I, my life will probably be improved if TikTok's not around because, like, realistically, it's not productive to be scrolling on TikTok. But the concerns, it's just like all mismatched. If like privacy is a concern, like there's a lot of other issues that are more important and need to be addressed. It's just, I think TikTok is just taking, for the most part, eyes off. You know more american companies it's like we want to sell your data <laughs> why are you letting yeah. china sell your data <laughs> yeah you mentioned uh the um class action against facebook there was also a lawsuit uh respecting apple because uh apple uh was also you know mining your data and the data could go anywhere so that kind of thing is happening in this country that, that kind of thing is happening right here in um I don't want to come right out and say I'm not really scared because TikTok is run in China, but I'm not really scared that TikTok is run in China. I am old enough, and I hate to admit it, uh, but um, I'm old enough. Well, I'll put this in the third person. Uh, I can recall the tail end of the Red Scare when you know it was true that there was mutually assured destruction both Russia or the Soviet Union and the United States had enough nuclear bombs to destroy the entire world even way back then and um, you know you had to duck and cover and as a kid I remember the the tail end of that when you know you had to do a bomb drill and you had to get under your desk as though your desk was your desk was going to protect yeah, you from nuclear yeah it's going to be what stops it <laughs> <laughs> but the point is um, all of our entire society had the red scare and the reds, the commies, the ruskies, you know, all these pejorative terms were the de rigueur of the day. And uh, we were all brought up to think that uh, Russia was our horrible, terrible, mortal enemy. And um, dur uh, I'm not that old to remember World War II, of course not. But I know from talking to people that were alive then and I know from reading my history book that we also had a lot of uh, pejoratives uh, for the Japanese and hatred for the Japanese at that time because of Pearl Harbor. And they even, uh, the government even put Japanese in internment camps. Then uh, we became more enlightened and realized that, you know what, I mean, there were some horrible people uh, that did some horrible people some things everywhere. So, you know, I am only bringing that up to point out that I might be wrong, but I think that this hatred of or, or dislike and distrust of China is way overblown. I mean, sure, they're buying farmland. Sure, they um, bought a lot of U.S. Treasury notes. Sure, we have debt to them. Sure, they're building some military bases in the Pacific. But I, I just, you know, in the perspective of the hatred towards Asians in history and uh, the um, red scare. I, I just, you know, I don't know why we're singling out the Chinese on a, in this type of a basis through TikTok. I just, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't seem logical to me. And I certainly hope we're not gearing up for, uh, you know, any kind of uh, confrontation mm -hmm. with China. But I mean, it just seems like the whole thing is misplaced. I mean, China is more into capitalism these days if you read into it they're more into building factories and yeah i know this i, know <laughs> I don't know anything about it at all so i, I know think there's I, bad I stuff going on there's there's, there's labor, apparently there's alleged you know child labor and that but the people of china have kind of turned the tide and they really have industrialized the whole country and they're into making money so mm -hmm. why would they want to do anything to hurt us? All right, that's just my political statement. I guess the name <laughs> of the show is a. The name of the show is about the law, so we should talk about some law with uh, um, these um, social media companies. I mean, Facebook and Twitter and the others uh, used to be a thing. Is MySpace still around? Mm, technically, but not really. It's not a big player. It's not a. So it's more of a music site than a social media site, and nobody really uses it. <laughs> And the, and the other one that I think falls into that same category is AOL. AOL. <laughs> Every now and then I still, you know, I ask a, a new client, what's your uh, email? And they tell me I'm, I'm Joe Blow at AOL.com. And I say, you're the one. <laughs> but anyhow, when the, when the Internet first came out, nobody knew what to do with it in terms of the law. I mean, 
is it a newspaper? Is it a phone company? Is it what? What is it? Can uh, if if you say something bad about me, uh, can I sue not only you but also Facebook? Um, is Twitter responsible? If if I say something bad about you on AOL, can you sue not only me but is AOL responsible? So Congress sat down and thought about it because they had to because these companies start generating a lot of money and these companies start employing a lot of people and so it becomes an important sector of the economy. So Congress sat down and thought about it and uh, under the 42nd title of the United States Code, they passed what's called Section 230. And what Section 230 did is it immunized uh, social uh, media Facebook and Twitter and um, at that point um, CompuServe and AOL and now today you know all the um, Twitters and uh, the others they're immune pretty much from liability if uh, there's a case of slander or defamation uh, whereas that was a question in the old days there was a distinction uh, newspapers uh, have editorial um, control over the content, so they can be held liable. If you if 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 you write a letter and say that I'm a rotten person, <laughs> and the newspaper publishes it, um, I have a defamation case against you and the newspaper. Um, however, that wasn't true of the telephone company. If you called and told me that I was a horrible person over the telephone. The telephone wasn't company wasn't liable. The distinction being that the newspapers are publishers and the telephone companies were platforms. So the Congress in 1997 said, "Well, okay, uh, we will. Uh, since this is the the courts are going all different ways, the federal district courts and the Supreme Court were looking at it and trying to figure out, you know, what do we do with the? So they passed Section 230." Now, with all the things that are happening uh, online, and you hear stories like you were talking about before about uh, uh, these hate uh, uh, groups. What did you call them? Hate groups? Hate, hate pages? Yeah, hate pages, hate groups, yeah. So now the question forums. is, yeah, hate forums. I mean, that's not right. And so now people are saying, should Congress revoke Section 230? And they've actually considered it and looked at it. I, I, it may or may not happen. I doubt it. If they do, it'll be in a limited sort of a way. But that's out there. That's out there as to um, whether or not they would remove the protections that they gave to all of the social media back then. And, yeah, you know, it's a tough issue. I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, what it do you makes, think? I don't know. Because... Um... It's hard where everybody can make a website now. Um, even, you know, a decade, almost two decades ago, um, there, I, I don't remember the name of the site, and God, I don't remember the name of the site, but I remember this one guy kept getting in legal trouble with his site because they were posting, like, revenge pictures of people on the site, but that site stayed up for years and years, and it's just like these people couldn't have anything done, so it's just like to a degree, it's like good where these where it's just like, okay, well, it's like now we can make the platform liable for this because it's just like this is malicious this is harmful or now with ai um it's becoming an increasing issue uh with ai generated you know explicit content of people where now you have like celebrities trying to fight with websites to get this content taken down so the liability issue makes a lot of sense because it's just like at one point like at, you want people to be able to freely express themselves but then you have like these specific pockets of the internet that some truly atrocious stuff is happening on right mm -hmm. yeah D don't talk too much about ai because we're going to actually do <laughs> uh, a, an entire podcast on artificial intelligence in the next couple of weeks so that's something to that look all forward to many many <laughs> we gotta keep the juice <laughs> can look forward to because artificial intelligence is kind of a scary concept and then you put it on the internet and um, you don't know what's you know who's behind it who's saying what um, but to get back to what you were saying about the weird websites there was a crazy story in Boston uh, before 
I'm not going to use the names because I just don't want to, but um, there was one radio talk show host who was very popular but also very controversial. Another radio talk show host in Boston grabbed his name and started a website with his name. And we'll, I'll just make up a name. Let's, let's say his name was uh, John Doe. The other radio talk show guy started a website that said johndoe.com, and he held it. And there was nothing that the real John Doe could do about it. There was absolutely nothing he could do about it because the other – and that just – it didn't seem right to me, but that was the law. So um, John Doe, the radio talk show host in Boston, could do nothing about the fact that this other guy held the website because the other guy got it first until, sadly, the other guy passed away. And at some point, uh, he lost control of the domain name, and John Doe, of course, immediately grabbed <laughs> the JohnDoe.com. But I mean, that I don't know that that didn't that it's didn't horrifying. seem right. That didn't seem yeah. There were actually lawsuits about that way back in the early days of the internet. Now we're going back into the dinosaurs, but you know, I can't remember whether it was Coca-Cola or um, Nabisco or one of the other huge manufacturers nationally. Um, someone. Put on their thinking cap when they first started selling domain names and they grabbed that name you know whether it was budweiser or whatever uh, we'll just use budweiser as an example they grabbed budweiser.com and there actually was litigation all the way up through the federal courts that budweiser said no we have a copyright and a trademark to that name you can't have that uh. but they had to go to federal court to resolve that issue Whereas the radio talk show guy in Boston, you know, he, for whatever reason, the courts went the other way on him. And I guess he wasn't willing to take it all the way up to the top courts. But those are the crazy things that um, have happened. And, I mean, the law that I was talking about before, the publisher and the platform distinction, those came about, you know, 200 plus years ago when those guys were writing the, you know, Madison and Franklin and when those guys were writing the Constitution. <laughs> in those days, the media consisted of what? <laughs> Newspapers, bulletins, guys actually physically standing on a soapbox in the <laughs> town. <laughs> so that was what media was uh, comprised of way back then. So that's what they were thinking of. And so, you know, they had no clue about radio, television, telephones, the Internet. Oh, my, that would have blown their minds. <laughs> What do you think those guys would have thought when they were sitting there, you know, with their uh, quill pens <laughs> dipping them in the ink, you know, <laughs> inking the Constitution? What do you think they would have thought if they'd even dreamed of the Internet? I, I, I doubt if they even dreamed of it. No, it's incredible. I mean, and that's like the scary thing right now where it's like you think about how much we've changed in just that past hundred years. You think about the Internet. The Internet's been around for like what almost 30 years now that's like such a small yeah. fragment of history where it's just like we've had all these law issues like up into this point and it's like we can't even comprehend where we're going to be in another 30 years from now it's like these poor people like wetting their ink quill like thinking about these laws is just like it's almost it's scary to think because it's just like how do you even like keep up with laws in such a shifting dynamic environment <laughs> like, it's it impossible is scary. it is scary but you know what's even scarier to me and i don't think this is an editorial comment this is this is legal analysis um it scares me that people that can't even balance the federal budget in washington dc want to hold hearings on changing the internet and changing and actually banning speech. I mean, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution clearly says Congress shall make no law abridging and then freedom of speech, freedom of uh, religion, uh, freedom to uh, peaceably assemble. But that's the very First Amendment. And it specifically says, quote, Congress shall make no law, unquote. Mm -hmm. So how can they, when we're now pushing $32 trillion of debt, which I forget the exact numbers, but for every single man, woman, and child in America, we each owe $120,000, something like that. I might be off by $10,000. But what's $10,000? Yeah, in literally. <laughs> um, that uh, they can actually, with a straight face, not balance a budget, but they can actually think about abridging the freedom of speech. Now, true to uh, form, uh, freedom of speech is not an absolute. 
for my friends in the news media. Uh, there are two exceptions, a couple of exceptions to freedom of speech. Uh, one is inflammatory and insightful speech. The case being you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Uh, that's actually a Supreme Court case because that could cause uh, harm. Uh, inflammatory speech, speech that incites violence. I mean, those are uh, exceptions to the total and complete uh, protection of the First Amendment. And the other, one of the other exceptions is uh, slander and defamation laws. I mean, you can slander somebody all day long, but if they make out a case for slander and defamation, you're going to have to pay them damages. So true there are exceptions and workarounds to the freedom of speech but it's uh, the people that wrote the constitution true as we just said they had no idea that the internet was going to come around but they were very clear when they said congress shall make no law so i would think that congress would have better things to do than speculate about you know what tiktok is doing because i don't know i just, uh, i might be i might be totally wrong about this i've been wrong before but it, seems to me the TikTok, you know, I mean, I don't I don't see it as a national security issue. I think it's an overreaction, as I said before. But that's just me. I don't know. I'm I'm just tell me uh, if I'm overreacting. But I just I think it's kind of odd that people when the law says Congress shall make no law. And now they're holding hearings about making a law. <laughs> well, especially when it's something so insignificant. Because like you said, it's just like yelling fire in a movie theater. Um, that's like comparable, not really comparable, but like how we had like these inappropriate websites and things along that nature. Where it's just like there's some things that you can do like online that are causing harm and that are, you know, unproductive and malicious. Um, but something like TikTok, you can't argue that TikTok is this huge problem that needs to be stopped when every single other social media site is trying to be TikTok. And YouTube has its shorts, Instagram reels, Facebook reels. It's like, what, like, what data, like, why are we so concerned about the data that TikTok is taking from people that are, you know, generally if they're posting something about their self-consenting, um, and even if it's like seeing our patterns and what we enjoy, it's just like, how is that any more harmful than any of these other YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, when they're all trying to be that same thing, you know? I think, I think their concern is not, you know, people are showing their puppy on TikTok. <laughs> or, you know, oh, oh, look, I have a new kitty cat. And there's a lot of that. Or, or look, uh, look at the recipe I made for dinner. I made this delicious uh, plant-based uh, <laughs> gourd for dinner. <laughs> and look at the picture. I don't think that's really what they're worried about. I think, I hate to state It's just the, the fact that it's uh, China. <laughs> right, I hate to state the case of uh, someone that I don't totally agree with. But I think their concern is that you know, it was on government computers. Now the U.S. government has now banned uh, TikTok on government computers, and the military has banned TikTok on military computers. And I think that's a good move because, you know, sure, you don't want troop movements uh, on TikTok. You don't want, you know, national security secrets that the government is discussing. You don't want Chinese or anyone. You don't want anybody to get that kind of stuff. I mean... So I can see that, but it would seem to me that the current, you know, outright, you know, wide open consideration of bringing in these people. And they, they actually brought the CEO of TikTok into Congress and they spent a day berating the guy. Oh, no, excuse me. They weren't berating him. They were asking him questions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, doing that is really unnecessary when there was a more narrow approach, which was to get it off of government computers and people that are in the military shouldn't be chatting about uh, what's going on in the military. But that to me is common sense that, you know, it shouldn't mm -hmm. have taken them so long to do that. But anyhow, that's just me. I guess we've gotten to the end of this. Um, why don't we remind our um, viewers that this is about the law. We hope if you've liked this episode that you subscribe and join, share it with your friends. Um, I just wanted to say something else. Um, we never really told our audience what about the law is all about, did we? 
Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you're. Oh, and, and you want your me to say? <laughs> <laughs> right. Sure. Well. I got the idea of doing a podcast at some point last year, and I thought about it and studied it and, you know, did a lot of research on what makes a good podcast and what makes a bad podcast. And um, I found that there are a lot of really great uh, podcasters out there on law, and they're all in true crime. Uh, And we've talked about this. Uh, One of them is uh, Annie Elise. Uh, She's a mother of two, and she's a really good storyteller, incredible storyteller. Um... I really, I have to admit, I didn't know much about the Alexander Murdoch case at all. I knew very little about it. I'd read the newspaper headlines. But somehow I stumbled across her podcast, and she said, this is a multi-layered thing. And here's a really long podcast. I think it was an hour and a half or almost two hours. And she said, hang with me because it's worth it. I'm like, yeah, right. (laughs) I was riveted to the computer because Annie Elise told the whole story Stephen Smith, the housekeeper supposedly stumbling over the dog, the whole thing of the crazy stories that are surrounding the um, murders of Paul Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch, and just the way she tells the story. She's just so talented, and there are – she's a non-lawyer, but a really good storyteller. Then there are lawyers, um, uh, the fellow down in Florida, um, Peter Trigos, I believe his name is, you know, the lawyer you know. He tells the same stories, but more with a um, legal uh, bent. And he's a very incisive uh, storyteller also, but he tells it uh, from a legal point of view. And then there's the woman you like, and you're getting me to like her. What, what's her name? Emily Baker? <laughs> Emily Baker! <laughs> And she does a good job, too. She really does a very good job. She's a former prosecutor. She's been pra- she's a former prosecutor from Los Angeles in um, 17 years of experience uh, practicing law. And she, too, tells a really good, incisive story about these crazy cases. Um, Letitia Stock, uh, Brian Kohlberger. Uh, unfortunately, there's so much material that these three that I just mentioned <laughs> – never run out of material so i'm saying to myself how am i going to compete with that when there's already so many really good intelligent articulate people doing podcasts so i'm saying to myself well even though i'm a lifelong true crime fan i have a couple of shelves full of ann rule books upstairs um why don't i try and make um and maybe i'm failing at it (laughs) stop (laughs) why don't i try and make uh civil law interesting why don't we try and do a podcast and not compete with anybody because i don't see a whole lot of civil law podcasts maybe it's because some people find it boring but we started out with topics that i had been blogging on for years and we got comments on for years things like how much is my personal injury case worth every single client that comes in to talk to me asks me so that was one of our first and then We branched off to topics that also were very popular, like where are the worst intersections in Massachusetts and New Hampshire? And we have some more of those. So that was my whole idea. But you were the one that told me all about um, Emily, and you like Emily, right? (laughs) I don't. So I haven't watched too much of Emily's content on her own channel, but she is like the queen of cameos and it's just like whenever somebody needs legal advice it's so awesome to see it's just like all right like ring up emily like, right 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 so, so she's then, awesome uh, uh, kind of branching into a whole different area um and it's not really a podcast so much as a radio show and a really great newsletter is kim commando i have learned almost everything i know about the computers from her she writes a really good newsletter and she's on the radio, and whenever uh, her syndication is run out in one city, I get really mad, and then I, I go on and I find that she's now on a different radio station. Uh-huh. Um, she's just a really intelligent, intelligent woman that just knows everything about the computer. So anyhow, that's uh, our goal here, and uh, Ellie, you've been really helpful with that. Um, and so people, uh, if you have any ideas for a future show, uh, please uh, email us or write it in the comments down below, or um, you can contact me through my website at attorney-myers.com, attorney-myers.com. 
com. Ellie? Yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. Like Andrew said, you have any ideas, please let us know. Um, even just the regular comments, you know, we love to see them. Even if you don't have a suggestion, it's always just so funny seeing what some of you guys have to say. So it, it's honestly really awesome. And I hope that, um, you know, one day in your minds, you can see us as, you know, you know, I mean, personally, not me, but Andrew has a lot of good knowledge about civil law. And I hope that you're able to find this, you know, entertaining. You're able to learn something and you're able to leave a little bit more fulfilled and educated and confident about seeking representation and taking control of your own life. So thank you so much for spending this time with us and watching today. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye bye. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen, in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts, and Derry, New Hampshire. Please give us a like and subscribe. The foregoing is offered for informational purpose only. It is not intended as, nor does it constitute, legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney who is thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies.